My name is Peter Nilsson. I teach English at Deerfield Academy, where I'm also Director of Research, Innovation, and Outreach. I have a few side projects, too, at peternilsson.us. You can find them there. Today, we'll talk about digital humanities in high school. I'll share some context to how I got into this. I'll do a demo of some, with some live coding. I'll talk about the curriculum for the course that we designed. I'll share some sample work from students. And I'll describe the future steps in the course that I'm working on. So context. When I was in college in the late 90s, I remember writing an essay on Heart of Darkness and wondering just how often the word darkness appeared in the text. Web browsers were still relatively new. I was relatively nerdy, so I knew that I could pull up the full text online at the UVA eText online library, uh, and I could just do a find-in page. And this was an early version of text mining I would come to learn, and it seemed like the beginning of something really good, if not yet something powerful. 14 years later, about seven years ago, I was an assistant dean at Deerfield Academy and where I teach and had learned some more complex ways of doing text mining and text analyses, still without coding at this point. At this point, I was consulting with math teacher colleagues about statistical formulas and hijacking Excel to process word lists to identify the significance of word frequencies. It was thrilling and it was now powerful, but it was not easy. Then, about two years ago, here at South by Southwest, I saw Stephen Wolfram give a presentation about some new functionality within Wolfram language, which is a programming language. And Wolfram language undergirds two other important tools. One of them is Mathematica. Mathematica is like high-powered mathematics and science software. It's like a real computational powerhouse. And the other tool is Wolfram Alpha. And Wolfram Alpha is a structured knowledge engine. When you ping Siri, Siri pings Wolfram Alpha. And you, that's where you can find structured information on who's won the Super Bowl over the last 20 years, to the genus and species of every animal, to any number of other things. So what Wolfram language does is undergirds both of those. And it, I learned two years ago, enables you to apply the computational power of Mathematica to the structured knowledge of Wolfram Alpha. And what Stephen Wolfram was presenting two years ago was really exciting for two reasons. One. The language was really, really easy to use. The second is there is more functionality that enabled you to apply Wolfram language to text. And when I saw that, I said, this is something I can do as an English teacher, and this is something my students can do. I talked to Stephen. I tracked him down after the talk. I visited the station down at the exhibition hall and started learning the language on my laptop on the flight back to Boston. And I realized off the bat that um, one can do some pretty remarkable computational things with texts with basically no training. So I'll do a short demo right now. And I'm going to move fast here because of the time. And I'm going to do my best to talk out loud while I'm coding. But it's hard to do that at the same time. So bear with me if I make mistakes either speaking or typing. And what I'd like you to look out for, though, is how in simple one-line commands I can do some pretty powerful things. So let's get right to that. I'm really excited to do this. I'm a little nervous. So, all right. Um, so I just put this first line up there because it's hard to do at the, at the presentation stand. But I'm just going to import a text. And I'm going to import the full text of The Great Gatsby. And there it is from the very beginning. I just had a text file that I pulled off online. I'm going to use a semicolon to, to hide it so you don't have to see that. And then I'm going to make a word cloud out of that text in just one line. And that's pretty cool. You'll see it in a moment. I'm not really a fan of word clouds. I think they're nice and they're pretty and they allow you to see word frequency visually, but you can't do anything with them the way you could if you actually had the numbers. So why don't we do some number? Let's do some numbers work here. Let's say I want to ask how many, how many words there are in the full text of The Great Gatsby. I can just do word count Gatsby. And we can find out that there are 48,490 words in The Great Gatsby. Let's say I want to find out how many of each individual word there are. I can just type word counts with an S at the end, Gatsby. And I can see, all right, the most commonly used word is the, and then and, and then uh. And I realized pretty quickly that there is this category of words called stop words that are commonly used words. And let's say I want to remove those stop words so that I can look at the words that are a little more interesting. I can say delete. Stop words, Gatsby, and oh, 
Here, is, here are the number of words. So I can see said is used most often, Gatsby is used most often. Now let's say that's pretty nice, but it would be easier if I could read it as a table. So I'm going to do data set, word counts, delete, stop words, and Gatsby. And here we go. And now we can look at this and say, all right, it's a little easier to look at because I can just look at it as a table and see uh, house, that's you know, relevant if you know the text. Eyes, that's relevant if you know the text. You can think about interpreting the text in a new way with that. I can scroll to the next page and see other words that are important. Car, hand, and face. Eyes, hand, and face makes you think about the way Fitzgerald uses the body in the text. You could explore that in an interesting way. So, now let's say I want to do something different, and I want to do something a little more computational with the words. So I'm going to turn the novel into a list of words, text words, Gatsby. And as somebody suggested a moment ago, I'm going to make this into its own variable, Gatsby words equals. And this is going to show us the whole text now from the opening line. In my younger and more vulnerable years, my father gave me some advice that I've been turning over in my mind ever since. But you can see there's a comma in between each one because it's made it into a list. So now I might ask the question, how long is each word in The Great Gatsby? If I want to think about the, the difficulty of the words that Fitzgerald uses. So let's do string length Gatsby words. All right. So I can see, look, in two letters, my two letters, younger, seven letters. That's pretty neat. Uh, what if I wanted to see the average length of a word in The Great Gatsby? Mean string length Gatsby words. Um, OK, but it shows it as a fraction, so let me put this little n at the end. The average length of a word is 4.2 letters long. Uh, that's still kind of hard to. to to think about, so I'm going to make a histogram of it, which is, well, you'll see in a moment, Gatsby words. And now I can see, all right, in Fitzgerald's The Great Gatsby, of all the words, I can see uh, how many of them are one-letter words, two-letter words, three-letter words, and so on. Um, I might also ask a question like, where does a particular word appear? Like, I wanted to know where darkness appeared in Heart of Darkness from beginning to end. Maybe in Gatsby, I want to ask the question, what is the string position? Where in the long string of the novel, of the novel, The Great Gatsby, is the word Gatsby? Uh, OK, that's a lot of numbers. If you can read numbers well, you might be able to interpret that. But if you can't, you might say, well, let's visualize this. So I'm going to turn this also into a histogram. Oh, oh yeah, there's one other thing I want to do. That's a little confusing. So I'm just going to go all one. That's something you learn later. And now you say, OK, here's the novel from beginning to end. And this is the frequency of the appearance of the word Gatsby throughout the novel. So we don't see much of Gatsby at the beginning. We see a lot of him in the middle. We don't see much about him as we go further on. Um, and that's just the beginning of what you can do with the positions of words as you search for different words within the text. I might want to explore more about Fitzgerald's vocabulary. What is the size of his vocabulary? Well, I know I have that list of the words in the text, but I want to delete all the duplicates. There are, what, 49,000 words in the text? I want to delete all the duplicate words <laughs> from Gatsby words. So let me take the length of that. Fitzgerald uses 6,501 unique words in The Great Gatsby, which tells us a little bit about his vocabulary, which is, which is interesting. And we can compare to other authors, or we can compare to a similar text. And I'm actually going to come back to this in just a little bit. Now, you might be wondering, OK, does this really get us into anything deep and meaningful about the text? We're going to come back to that a little bit later when you look at what the students did with this, which is just extraordinary. Um, a few other things that, that are really neat. It allows us to look at sentences within the text and automatically break the text down into sentences. I'm going to hide that so we don't have to see the whole text again and call this Gatsby sentences. And now I've just made a list. So I'm going to do the length of that list to see how many sentences long the novel is. It's 2,669 sentences long. And if I want to look at individual ones, I might say, OK, Gatsby sentences 
What's the first sentence? Oh, there it is again in my younger, more vulnerable years. Now there's that famous last sentence too. How would I find that? Boom. <laughs> yes. Have you ever used this before? I have never used it. Okay, so this is just like <laughs> students in the first day of class or in the first week of class. And so here's that famous final line from The Great Gatsby. Uh, and you can pull out individual lines in, the, in, these, in these individual ways. Now you could also say, what's the, how long are his sentences? Let's go word count. Gatsby sentences. All right, this is going to give us another long list. So let's make a histogram out of that so we can see the distribution of lengths. Word count Gatsby sentences. Boom. And this should show us if I did this right. Okay, so in F. Scott Fitzgerald's writing, we can see the distribution of length of sentences throughout his text. Um, I'm just going to show a teaser of two more things to preview a little bit of what the students did later in the higher level or deeper work that the students did. Text structure is this really interesting command where I can look at Gatsby sentences. I'm going to take the first sentence, and I just want to look at the parts of speech. And here is the first sentence of the novel parsed by part of speech of each word, preposition, pronoun, adjective. Once you can do that, then you can start to do some really interesting things by taking apart the grammar of the text. And the last thing I'll do before moving back to the course is this same thing again, but it even understands the relationships within the sentence. So younger and more vulnerable are an adjective phrase modifying years, which younger and more vulnerable years is a noun phrase, or my younger and more vulnerable years is a noun phrase modifying, or part of a prepositional phrase. So all these structures are built into it, and, the, and it can analyze all these things. And then we, as students of literature, can look really closely at this in interesting ways. So I'm going to go back to the presentation here. And I did it. No, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> So what's amazing here, particularly if you have other programming experience, is that performing each function required only one line of code, like word cloud, or sometimes even one word, word cloud, or word count, or text sentences. In other programming languages, each of these steps required eight to 10 or more lines of code and for loops and other things. But with this, once you're familiar with the basic commands, it only takes a day or two with students to get them up to speed and you can perform some, some calculations and computations and analyses. So, Recognizing that this was a powerful tool, we brainstormed some course objectives. It was hard, and then we simplified it down to a curriculum, a term-long curriculum to achieve those objectives uh, in a warm-up assignment and then four projects with an interlude in the middle. First, with our students, we did a three-day warm-up using Google Ngram Viewer to start helping our students think quantitatively about text. Then we followed with a week-long project in which students performed some of those text mining analyses on Hamlet and on two other texts of their choice to really look at Shakespeare's writing and the writing of other people they were interested in. And then we asked them after they had a little more experience under their fingertips to do a one-week text mining project on their own writing, comparing their own words and sentences to those of the writers and Shakespeare and others. This was pretty exciting. Then we paused as a class to take stock of all that they had learned and what, that they, what they might do with it. We shared with students a range of digital humanities projects that they might not have seen before uh, and invited them to consider something in a topic of interest to them and how they might apply these approaches. We then spent two to three days practicing question formulation. How can you ask a good question about a topic of your interest that uses these tools? That launched them into a two to three week self-directed project on a topic of their choice. And then a second two to three week project after that where they could deepen their analysis of the first project or they could start up a new project altogether feeling a little more confident, or having presented all their work to each other, they could pick up somebody else's project and deepen their work, so long as they showed that they had added value to that. The results of this were awesome. <laughs> Students had command of basic functions in Wolfram language, like the ones I demonstrated before, and we gave them resources to learn more advanced functions as they needed, and we would be there to help. One student started with the question, who is the best rap artist? Too broad, we said. So we worked with him to focus the question. What about rhyme? Wolfram language can translate each word in the data set into phonemes. So can you tell what 
song this is? His palms are sweaty, knees weak, arms are heavy. You know, you can hear the sounds of that. I'm saying, ah, Eddie, palms sweaty, knees weak, arms are heavy. That ah, Eddie, once you've quantified it into phonemes, once you've put it into phonemes, you can count the phonemes. You can see how close they are to each other. You can start to assess internal rhyme through the consistency of phonemes throughout it. And so he started, he then compared internal rhyme in Lose Yourself versus internal rhyme in Kendrick Lamar's Rap God and started to then say, well, which rap artist has the greatest phonetic density in his writing as a way of saying who's the best rap artist. Another student asked about social network analysis in the Bible. Who is the central figure in each book in the Bible, he asked, based on their name placement in relation to others? How can social network graphs help us better visualize relationships in the Old Testament, which is what you see here? A third student looked at speeches by women's rights activists and civil rights activists and looked at their use of pronouns and said, what pronouns are most common in their speeches? They, them, or their would say that the speech focuses on whoever the other is. We, us, or our focuses on the common experience of the people listening to the speech. I, me, or my focuses on the speaker's story or thoughts. So here's Elizabeth Warren, and you can see that she has a greater we, our, us than me, my, I, and they, their, them ratio in her speeches. Another student looked at the evolution of Donald Trump's Wikipedia page from before he announced his campaign to 100 days into his campaign. Uh, and you could, he could ask which words uh, were added uh, during that time and what conclusions can you draw from that about how perception about him changed in Wikipedia. Another student did uh, how have the Beatles lyrics changed over time performed a similar analysis. Uh, he imported the complete lyrics from Beatles albums. Anyway, I'm going to move past this. These are the words that appear only in the Abbey Road album and not in any of the other albums. So these were pretty exciting projects. And in the process of pursuing them, the kids learned to ask different kinds of questions. They learned to use some new tools. They learned to work collaboratively. And we felt at the end, though, that after that big mess of goals that you saw, which I flashed past really quickly, we felt we could simplify and improve that. So we debriefed at the end of the year. We're planning to teach the course again this coming spring, but we've streamlined a set of objectives. When we thought about what was most important in our work and in the work that they were doing, it was these things. What are our character objectives, our skill objectives, and our content objectives? And what we've refined it down to, for our class, the character objectives are to practice unstructured play for learning. We want to give students tools and see what they do with them. We want to practice structured experimentation because we also want to see them be rigorous in their experimentation after a period of play. And we want them to practice persistence. When you're learning to code, even code like this, it requires making mistakes, as I did on stage today, and then figuring out what to do next and to try again. And we also had skill objectives. Ultimately, we recognized that the class is interdisciplinary. It required some scientific experimentation and humanistic interpretation. So we wanted them to develop skill in question formulation, in problem decomposition, in interpretation of evidence and argumentation, and also metacognitive reflection. How would you have done that differently when you were finished? And lastly, we had content objectives. And these fell mostly within the category of computer science. We wanted them to develop an understanding of basic data structures. But we wanted them to do it organically, like the way you do in a language class, by, through immersion. We didn't start with strings, lists, and tables, but they learned what those were through the course of their work. Uh, we want them to be confident in the use of basic operations, counting, manipulating, and comparing. And we wanted them to have exposure, just exposure, to the use of more difficult operations, uh, like data visualization and network analysis. I'll end here, once I see the cameras go down. And then uh, we've been recording our work on a website, distantreading.org. So you can visit that and see the first iteration. And once we finish our second iteration this summer, we'll post more materials there. You can also find in more information at my website, peternilson.us. Thank you. <laughs>